The siege of Sevastopol also known as the defense of Sevastopol or the Battle of Sevastopol was a military engagement that took place on the eastern front of the Second World War. The campaign was fought by the Axis powers of Germany and Romania against the Soviet Union for control of Sevastopol, a port in the Crimea on the Black Sea. On the 22nd of June 1941 the Axis invaded the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa. Axis land forces reached the Crimea in the autumn of 1941 and overran most of the area. The only objective not in Axis hands was Sevastopol. Several attempts were made to secure the city in October and November 1941. A major attack was planned for late November, but heavy rains delayed it until 17 December 1941. Under the command of Erich von Monstein, Axis forces were unable to capture Sevastopol during this first operation. Soviet forces launched an amphibious landing on the Crimean Peninsula at Kerch in December 1941 to relieve the siege and force the Axis to divert forces to defend their gains. The operation saved Sevastopol for the time being, but the bridgehead in the eastern Crimea was eliminated in May 1942. After the failure of their first assault on Sevastopol, the Axis opted to conduct siege warfare until the middle of 1942, at which point they attacked the encircled Soviet forces by land, sea, and air. On 2 June 1942, the Axis began this operation, codenamed Storfang. The Soviet Red Army and Black Sea Fleet held out for weeks under intense Axis bombardment. The German Air Force played a vital part in the siege, its 8th Air Corps bombing the besieged Soviet forces with impunity, flying 23,751 sorties and dropping 20,528 tons of bombs in June alone. The intensity of the German airstrikes was far beyond previous German bombing offensives against cities such as Warsaw, Rotterdam or London. At the end of the siege, there were only 11 undamaged buildings left in Sevastopol. The Luftwaffe sank or deterred most Soviet attempts to evacuate their troops by sea. The German 11th Army suppressed and destroyed the defenders by firing 46,750 tons of artillery ammunition on them during Storfang. Finally, on 4 July 1942, the remaining Soviet forces surrendered and the Germans seized the port. The Soviet separate coastal army was annihilated, with 118,000 men killed, wounded or captured in the final assault and 200,481 casualties in the siege as a whole for both it, and the Soviet Black Sea Fleet. Axis losses in Storfang amounted to 35,866 men, of whom 27,412 were German and 8,454 Romanian. With the Soviet forces neutralized, the Axis refocused their attention on the major summer campaign of that year, Case Blue and the advance to the Caucasus oil fields. Chapter 1 – Background The Soviet naval base at Sevastopol was one of the strongest fortifications in the world. Its site, on a deeply eroded, bare limestone promontory at the southwestern tip of the Crimea, made an approach by land forces exceedingly difficult. The high-level cliffs overlooking Sevenaya Bay protected the anchorage, making an amphibious landing just as dangerous. The Soviet Navy had built upon these natural defenses by modernizing the port and installing heavy coastal batteries consisting of 180mm and 305mm repurposed battleship guns which were capable of firing inland as well as out to sea. The artillery emplacements were protected by reinforced concrete fortifications and 9.8-inch thick armored turrets. The port was a valuable target. Its importance as a potential naval and air base would enable the Axis to conduct far-ranging sea and air operations against Soviet targets into and over the Caucasus ports and mountains. The Red Air Force had been using the Crimea as a base to attack targets in Romania since the Axis invasion in June 1941, proving its usefulness as an air base. Likewise, the Wehrmacht had launched a bombing raid on the Sevastopol naval base at the start of the invasion. Since the beginning of Barbarossa, the offensive against the USSR had not really addressed Crimea as an objective. 
German planners assumed the area would be captured in mopping up operations once the bulk of the Red Army was destroyed west of the Dnieper River. But in June, attacks by Soviet aircraft from Crimea against Romania's oil refineries destroyed 12,000 tons of oil. Hitler described the area as an unsinkable aircraft carrier and ordered the conquest of Ukraine and Crimea as vital targets in Directive 33, dated 23 July 1941. The command of the army issued orders that the Crimea was to be captured as soon as possible to prevent attacks on Romanian oil supplies, vital to the German military. Hitler, impatient with obstruction to his commands to advance in the south, repeated on 12 August his desire that the Crimea be taken immediately. Over a month later, during the capture of Kiev, General Oberst Erich von Monstein was given command of the German 11th Army on 17 September. After only a week in command, he launched an assault upon Crimea. After severe fighting, Monstein's forces defeated several Soviet counteroffensives and destroyed two Soviet armies. By 16 November, the Wehrmacht had cleared the region, capturing its capital Simferopol, on 1 November. The fall of Kerch on 16 November left only Sevastopol in Soviet hands. By the end of October 1941, Major General Ivan Yefimovich Petrov's independent coastal army, numbering 32,000 men, had arrived at Sevastopol by sea from Odessa further west, it having been evacuated after heavy fighting. Petrov set about fortifying the inland approaches to Sevastopol. He aimed to halt the Axis drive on the port by creating three defense lines inland, the outermost arc being 16 kilometers from the port itself. Soviet forces, including the Soviet 51st Army and elements of the Black Sea Fleet, were defeated in the Crimea in October and were evacuated in December, leaving Petrov's force as Sevastopol's main defense force. Having cleared the rest of the Crimea between 26 September to 16 November, the Romanian 3rd Army and German 11th Army prepared for an attack on the port. The German 11th Army was the weakest on the entire front, initially containing only seven infantry divisions. The Romanians contributed a large force, but were only lightly equipped and generally lacked heavy artillery. The weather turned against the Axis in mid-October and torrential downpours delayed the build-up. This gave Vice Admiral Filip Ekchebrisky, commander of the Black Sea Fleet, time to bring in men and materiel from Novorossiysk. By 17 December, the weather had cleared sufficiently for the Axis to begin a major operation. Chapter 2 – Forces Involved Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Axis the German 11th Army, commanded by Erich von Monstein, besieged Sevastopol. At the time of the final assault in June 1942, 11th Army consisted of nine German infantry divisions in two corps, and one Romanian corps, being the Romanian 7th Mountain Corps. Significant support was given by the Luftwaffe. The Oberkommando der Luftwaffe dispatched Luftflotte 4's 8th Air Corps for support. It consisted of nine Jeshwada containing 600 aircraft, all coming under the command of General Oberst Wolfram Freiherr von Richthofen. Among this contingent was a powerful concentration of medium bomber, dive bomber, and torpedo bomber Jeshwada. Naval support came from the Italian 101st Squadron under Francesco Mimbelli. It consisted of four motor torpedo boats, five explosive motorboats, six CB-class midget submarines, and a number of 35-ton coastal submarines and mass boats. This force was the only Axis naval force deployed during the siege. Although Bulgaria was not technically at war with the Soviet Union, its naval staff worked closely with the Wehrmacht, and despite not being committed to combat, they provided bases for the Axis Naval Command to operate in the waters of the Black Sea. The Axis Order of Battle Chapter 2 Section 2 – Soviet The defense of Sevastopol was provided mainly by the Black Sea Fleet and the separate coastal army under Ivan Yefimovich Petrov. The Black Sea Fleet sent 49,372 personnel to fight as infantry. Most were not trained for ground combat, and the act was an ad hoc emergency measure. 
The naval brigades formed had four to six battalions of 4,000 men, allowing them to absorb significant losses. These forces were well armed, having a variety of artillery and mortar battalions. Almost 20% of the coastal army were naval personnel. In the separate coastal army, the strongest divisions were the 95th, 109th, 172nd, and 388th Rifle Divisions. They each had around 7,000 soldiers, the rest of the Red Army units having around 5,000 personnel. Some 5,000 reinforcements made it into Sevastopol in May 1942. However, Petrov's army lacked tanks and anti-aircraft guns. The garrison also lacked food supplies and mortar ammunition, which would severely sap Soviet strength. Poor communications between headquarters and the front lines were also an issue. Petrov found it difficult to respond to Axis attacks quickly. Chapter 3, First Axis Offensive The German 11th Army's first task was to break through into the Crimea. The cities of Perekop and Isen guarded the narrow corridor of land, which linked the Crimea to the bulk of Ukraine. Erich Oskar Hansen's Liv Corps, with its 45th and 73rd Infantry Divisions, broke through at Perekop at the cost of 2,641 casualties in six days of fighting. The Soviet forces launched a counteroffensive against the 11th Army's flank at Militopol. Monstein withdrew his other corps in order to deal with it. The resulting battle ended with the destruction of two attacking Soviet armies. By the time that this threat had been dealt with, the Stavka had rushed in reinforcements and established another defense line at Isen. Ordered to concentrate on the Crimea once more, Monstein launched his Liv Corps, this time with the support of the German 22nd Infantry Division, into the assault. The Soviet forces enjoyed local air superiority and armored reserves. They also outnumbered the attacking Wehrmacht. In spite of this, the defending Soviet 51st Army was pushed back. The Wehrmacht suffered 5,376 casualties in 12 days of combat, and the Red Army many more. By the end of October, the 51st Army was crushed and in full retreat into the Crimea. The situation in the air also changed. Arriving Yagishvada won air superiority for the Axis. On 22 and the 23rd of October, Yagishvada 3, JG 52, and JG 77 crippled the Soviet air strength in the Crimea. Over the two days, they destroyed 33 Soviet aircraft for one loss. In the six days from 18th to 24th of October, 140 Soviet aircraft were lost, 124 of them to Luftwaffe fighters. Heinkel He 111s of KG 26 and KG 51 and Junkers Du 87 Stukas of SDG 77 were free to attack Soviet ground positions, contributing to the collapse of the Soviet Crimean Front on 27 October. Chapter 3 Section 1 Sevastopol Offensive Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 2 Initial Battles With the front collapsing and the Axis closing in on Sevastopol, Vice Admiral Ekchebrisky assumed command of the port on 4 November 1941. The city had a civilian population of 111,000 in 1941, and most were sent to work on the three defense lines around the port. Only the 7th and 8th Naval Infantry Brigades were available for combat in the port. More naval infantry were formed from ships in the harbor. The 8th Naval Infantry Brigade was sent to guard the northeastern approaches near the Momokai Belbek Line. The 7th was deployed in the center, near Mikenzaya. With only 20,000 soldiers, Ekchebrisky relied heavily on his 12 coastal battalions to slow down the Axis. The 62nd Fighter Brigade contributed 61 fighters, which were able to achieve temporary air superiority. On 30 October, the Soviet defenses detected the spearhead of the German 132nd Infantry Division and shelled it at 12.30 on 1 November using Battery 30's 305mm coastal guns. The Germans designated the fort as Fort Maxim Gorky I Wehrmacht lacked sufficient air and mobile units to force a decision. 
Instead, Monstein ordered Hansen's live quarter head east down the Sevastopol Simferopol rail line towards Yalta, while the 72nd Infantry Division was to head to Balaclava, effectively encircling Sevastopol. Once there, it would attack Sevastopol from the east. The 132nd made reasonable progress, but was stopped on 2 November by the 8th Naval Brigade. The Wehrmacht suffered 428 casualties. Monstein ordered a halt for a week, whilst bringing up reserves. Ekchebrisky used his fleet to bring in a further 23,000 men from the Caucasus. On 9 November, Petrov's army was brought in, bringing 19,894 soldiers, 10 T-26 tanks, 152 artillery pieces, and 200 mortars. The Red Army now had 52,000 troops in the area of the city. The Luftwaffe was considered weak, so the Soviet Navy kept the heavy cruiser Krasny Kavkaz, light cruisers Krasny Krim and Shervona Ukraina, and seven destroyers to protect the port. The Luftwaffe did what it could to disrupt the Soviet defenses. On 31 October, the destroyer Bodrai shelled German positions along the coastline. SDG 77 Ju 87s attacked and wounded 50 of its crew by strafing its deck and superstructure with machine gun fire. On 2 November, Junkers Ju 88s of KG 51 scored several hits on the cruise of Voroshilov and put it out of action for months. On 7 November, He 111s from KG 26 sank the liner Armenia evacuating soldiers and civilians from Sevastopol with only eight of the 5,000 passengers surviving. On 12 November, SDG-77 sank the cruiser Shervona Ukraina, and KG-26 damaged the destroyers Sovasheni and Bisposhkidny. But with the Luftwaffe units being dispatched to other sectors and theatres, the Soviet forces again achieved air superiority with 59 aircraft. Monstein wanted to launch an attack as soon as possible, but his logistical lines were poor. Wanting to avoid strong Soviet forces protecting the north of the port, including the 95th Rifle Division, Monstein chose to press the center and southern Soviet defenses. He ordered the German 50th Infantry Division to probe the center of the Soviet line east of the Chernaya River. The 132nd Infantry Division supported the probe and was able to push to within 4 kilometers of Sevenaya Bay. The 72nd Rifle Division, with the support of the coastal batteries, moved in to stop the attack. The 72nd Infantry Division continued towards Balaclava, and the 22nd Infantry Division joined the assault. Assisted by shelling from two light cruisers and the battleship Pariskaya Communa, the Red Army halted this attack, and Monstein called off the offensive on 21 November, having lost 2,000 men. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection The 3rd of December Offensive Monstein recognized that he could not take the port quickly, and was going to have to organize a proper set-piece offensive. With German offensive operations suspended in December, Monstein found himself the only commander on the Eastern Front with an offensive mission. He was not ready to carry out his attack until 17 December. In the meantime, Ekchebrisky used the interval to sail the 11,000 soldiers of the 388th Rifle Division into Sevastopol between 7 to 13 December. Soviet engineers began laying extensive minefields and barbed wire belts. By the time of the Axis attack, Petrov's force held a strong defensive position. The naval commander demanded that Petrov hold the coast along the northern flank of Sevastopol on the Belbek River in order to retain Coastal Battery 10, an artillery complex near Momoskai. On the other hand, the German Liv Corps had only 15,551 men in its four infantry divisions. Over 7,000 soldiers in the German 11th Army were on the sick list at that time. It was also short of artillery ammunition, and heavy artillery. In order to commit as many forces to the battle as possible, Monstein left the weak 42 Corps, containing just the 46th Infantry Division and two Romanian brigades, to protect the entire front from Yalta to Kerch. The attack began at 6.10 on 17 December. 
The 22nd Infantry Division attacked the 8th Naval Brigade on the Belbeck River, pushing west towards the coast, while the 50th and 132nd Infantry Divisions conducted fixing attacks on the Soviet center. The 22nd succeeded in rolling up the flank of the Naval Brigade after five days of fighting. However, Ekchebrysky ordered its retirement south towards Sevastopol, abandoning Momoskai and forming a new front north of Belbek City in the Belbek River. In the south, 30 Corps tried and failed to break through with the 72nd and 170th Infantry Divisions. Only minor gains were made against the 172nd Rifle Division, even with help from the Romanian 1st Mountain Brigade. The 79th Naval Brigade and 345th Rifle Division arrived by sea as reinforcements, using the long winter nights and their naval superiority. Meanwhile, the battleship Pariskaya Commune shelled German forces whenever they threatened a breakthrough. The offensive came to an abrupt end when the Red Army staged an amphibious landing at Kerch. Chapter 3 Section 2 Kerch Landing Between 26 and 30 December 1941, the USSR launched an amphibious assault on the Kerch Peninsula to relieve the encircled Soviet forces at Sevastopol. It succeeded in gaining and sustaining a bridgehead for five months. However, a German minus led counteroffensive named Operation Busted Hunt destroyed the bridgehead and the three Soviet armies, supporting the landing in May 1942. This allowed Monstein to concentrate all of his resources against Sevastopol for the first time. The front over Sevastopol grew quiet and a stalemate ensued. The Luftwaffe kept up the pressure on Soviet sea communications and although supplies still made it through, Vice Admiral Ekchebrysky, commanding the Black Sea Fleet, was forced to reduce the number of coastal bombardment missions. Chapter 4, Second Axis Offensive Chapter 4 Section 1, Unternehmen Storfang Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 2 Soviet Defense Sevastopol was still a formidable obstacle. Its airfields provided a base for the Red Air Force to attack the Axis-held Soviet coastline and Romania proper. It was also home to the Black Sea Fleet. Its main fortifications were pointed seaward, while the land defenses encircled the city at a distance of 15 to 20 kilometers, with an inner defense belt at a range of 5 kilometers. Enhancing the man-made defenses was the forested, rugged terrain. To the north of Sevenaya Bay there were 11 batteries and strongpoints. They were given morale-boosting names such as Stalin, Maxim Gorky I, Molotov, and Lenin. They were defended by the 1st Coastal Army. Elsewhere, the Red Army had constructed hundreds of timber bunkers with machine gun nests and 45mm anti-tank artillery. Along the outer belt, concrete bunkers were less common, 19 being stretched across its 37 kilometers. Soviet engineers laid thousands of mines, including PMD-6 wooden anti-personnel mines, TMD-40 wooden anti-tank mines, and barbed wire obstacle belts. Petrov, commanding the independent coastal army, had a powerful artillery pool. Petrov had on strength some 455 artillery pieces and howitzers. Among those were 34 plus 152 mm and 40 plus 122 mm howitzers and 918 mortars. Ammunition was adequate for a battle of two weeks for these calibers, but 82 mm mortar ammunition was in short supply. The battles of the Crimean campaign had taken their toll, and scarcely any tank and anti aircraft artillery support were available. A further force, under Major General Petr Morgnov, was added. The coastal artillery force was semi-independent for much of the siege, and had an initial strength of 12 batteries and 45 guns, although more were added during 1942. By the time of the German June offensive, the Soviet forces had available 8 305mm, 1 188mm, 10 plus 152mm and 17 plus 130mm, 3 120mm, 8 100mm, and 4 45mm guns. Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 3 Axis Forces By this time, 
the Axis was facing a serious manpower and artillery shortage. The German 11th Army's divisions had anywhere between 35 and 75 percent of their initial strength. The German 22nd Infantry Division was the strongest division, and was only short 1,750 personnel, while the weakest was the 132nd Infantry Division, which was short 2,300 men. The 170th Infantry Division had to collapse one of its regiments to bring the others up to strength. The German infantry force was a fragile force at Sevastopol and Monstein could not afford to squander it. German doctrine stressed bypassing strongpoints, but since this was not possible, German infantry were forced to reduce one fort after another. Some 65 Sturmgeschutz 3 assault guns were available to support them. The assault was based around battalion strength infantry assault groups, supported by a platoon of engineers and a few assault guns. Two pioneer battalions were attached to each division to spearhead the attack and break through fixed and fortified defenses. The eight battalions of Liv Corps each contained around 386 men on average, and were equipped with 10 to 12 flame throwers, 28 to 30 mine detectors, 3,000 kilograms of high explosives, 2,200 hand grenades, and 500 smoke grenades. The 300th Panzer Battalion, a remote controlled, tank unit using the Goliath tract mine, was made available for destroying fortifications. The total number of artillery pieces came to 785 German, and 112 Romanian medium and heavy guns. Most of these were under the command of Liv Corps, the main assault force. To increase this arsenal, a number of super-heavy artillery pieces were made available. Three 600mm Karl Gerecht self-propelled mortars and one 800mm gun, delivering 1.4 and 7 ton shells, respectively, and capable of destroying any fortification. However, the Karl Gerecht guns only had a range of between 4 to 6,000 meters, which made them vulnerable to counter-battery fire. Moreover, only 201 rounds of 600 mm and a 48 round of 800 mm ammunition were available. Most of it was used up before the infantry assault. More useful to the German infantry were the two 280 mm railway guns. Two 420 mm, two 355 mm howitzers were also available, along with four 305 mm mortars. Both of the 420mm guns were of First World War vintage, short in range and with limited ammunition. Some nine 283mm mortars were also available, but they were pre-1914 weapons and six had burst during firing. Artillery acquired from Czechoslovakia after the Munich Agreement, the Skoda 305mm Model 1911 howitzer was also available. At the divisional level, 268 plus 105 mm and 80 plus 150 mm weapons were in service, including 126 naval Werfer infantry barrage rocket launchers. Overall, the German 11th Army's artillery was a collection of modern, obsolete, and foreign built weapons. For the offensive, 183,750 rounds of 105 mm and 47,300 rounds of 150 mm ammunition were stockpiled, enough for 12 days of firing. Dot to reinforce the 11th Army, the Romanians were committed to the assault. The Romanian 18th Infantry Division was at full strength, and plenty of Romanian infantry were available. However, the 18th Division was inexperienced and made up of reservists. The Romanian 1st Mountain Division was considered an elite force, and its addition was to prove useful. They had 112 guns available, but virtually no engineers. The weakness of their artillery and supporting arms made the Romanian X Corps reliant on the German forces for anything other than set piece infantry attacks. The Luftwaffe had to compensate for the Axis artillery limitations. A powerful air armada was brought together. Under the 8th Air Corps, von Richthofen assembled six Kampfgruppen originating from six different Kampfschwade, KG-51 Edelweiss, KG-76, KG-100, 
and 3 Grupper slash LG1 Specialist Training Wing. Dive bomber support from SDG-77 was also given to Richthofen. He could call upon 3 Gruppen of Ju-87s. Jägerschwader JG-3 Udert, and JG-77 hers as were available for air superiority operations. 2 Grupper slash KG-26 Low was also available for anti-shipping operations, in addition to the air land effort carried out by the 8th Air Corps. The Luftwaffe could not support the land assault, and maintain pressure on Soviet sea communications alone. With only KG-26 engaged in anti-shipping operations against Soviet sea communications, the OKW looked to the Kriegsmariner to supply Schnellboot motor torpedo boats to help eliminate Soviet shipping supplying and evacuating the port. The time it took to dismantle and move the 92-ton boats by rail to Romanian ports was going to be too long. In a rare appeal for help, the German forces turned to their Italian allies, aware of their expertise with motor torpedo boat operations. The Regia Marina sent the 101st Naval Squadron, which brought nine torpedo boats and nine coastal submarines under the command of the highly competent Capitano di Frigata Francesco Mimbelli. The Italian boats were only 24 tons and the submarines were 35 tons, which made them easier to transport by truck and barge. The squadron was based at Feodosia and Yalta, which made it the only Axis naval force to participate in the siege. Chapter 4 Section 2 – Battle Chapter 4 Section 2 – Subsection 2 – Air Offensive Monstein demanded an all-out assault by the Luftwaffe before the main ground action began. Situated only 70 kilometers from Sevastopol, the German formations had barely enough time to reach altitude before reaching their targets. The 8th Air Corps began its bombing campaign along the north and southeast of the city. At the same time, German medium bombers conducted rolling attacks on the city, which included all units except LG-1, which engaged in suppressing anti-aircraft installations. Oil, electricity, water pumps, harbor facilities, and submarine bases were attacked by SDG-77 Ju-87s. Von Richthofen watched the bombing from an observation post close to the front. The targets were badly damaged, and fires broke out all over the port city. The Luftwaffe flew 723 missions and dropped 525 tons of high explosive on the first day. Despite heavy anti-aircraft fire, just one Ju-87 was lost. While the bulk of the Luftwaffe was busy with the land battle, 3 KG-26 sought to break Soviet sea communications. They sank the tanker Mikhail Gromov, but the flotilla leader Tashkent, the destroyer Bazuprekny, and transport Abkhazia escaped to bring 2,785 soldiers into the fortress. Air support continued with 643 sorties on 3rd of June, 585 on the 4th of June, and 555 on the 5th of June, with some German crews flying daily averages of 18 missions. By the start of the ground attack on the 7th of June, the Luftwaffe had flown 3,069 sorties and 2,000. 264 tons of high explosive and 23,800 incendiary bombs were dropped. Many of the bombs dropped were 1,000 kg SC-1000, 1,400 kg SC-1400, and 2,500 kg SC-2500 bombs. The heavy caliber weapons were aimed at Soviet concrete bunkers. Ivan Laskin, commanding the 172nd Rifle Division in the northern sector recalled, bombers in groups of 20 to 30 attacked us without caring for their targets. They came in, wave after wave, and literally plowed up the earth throughout our defense area. German aircraft were in the air above our positions all day long. The sky was clouded by smoke from explosions of thousands of bombs and shells. An enormous dark, grey cloud of smoke and dust rose higher and higher and finally eclipsed the sun. The German air campaign against Sevastopol in June 1942 surpassed by far the German bombings of Warsaw, Rotterdam or London. From 3 to 6 June, 
The Luftwaffe carried out 2,355 operations and dropped 1,800 tons of high explosives. On the 7th of June, Monstein ordered the ground assault. The Luftwaffe carried out 1,368 sorties and dropped 1,300 tons of bombs on Soviet positions, but the Soviet infantry clung on. Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 3 Ground Fighting, 7-10 June Liv Corps was to strike the main blow. Situated on the northeast edge of the city, they struck along the lines of least resistance, across the Belbek River while the German 30 and Romanian Mountain Corps conducted holding attacks in the south and center, respectively. Both the latter corps did not start major operations until 8 June. The artillery bombardment targeted bunkers with 105 mm fire, which usually received 10 to 25 rounds. German Flak 36-37 mm guns also did an effective job of eliminating machine gun nests. The German forces were also quick to bring up 88 mm artillery guns to fire directly into bunker apertures. Between 2 and 6 June, the German 11th Army expended 9% of its munitions on pre-advance shelling. The railway guns also fired a few rounds at the main fortifications and rail lines, but most missed by some distance. The closest shell landed 80 meters away from its target. Soviet ammunition dumps were also targeted by these weapons, with no effect. The main fortifications, Forts Stalin, Molotov, and Maxim Gorky remained active. It was not until the afternoon of 6 June when a single 60 cm caliber mortar shell from the Karl Garrett self-propelled mortar No. 3, nicknamed Thor, knocked out Maxim Gorky's second turret, damaging the weapon. This was the only success of the German super-heavy guns, which did not have an impact commensurate with their expense. The Luftwaffe had a greater impact, using its Ju-87s to knock out the communications systems of the fort. On the morning of 7 June 1942, the German infantry began advancing cautiously. 30 corps attacked the southern positions held by the 7th Naval Brigade and 388th Rifle Division. The German infantry advanced behind air and artillery support. The infantry seemed afraid of their fire support and did not advance close enough behind it. The bombardment also failed to have enough of an effect. The Soviet forces held their fire until the German forces were well within range before opening fire, and little progress was made. Von Richthofen was angered by the fear of the infantry and called the day a real disappointment. The next few days were not much better, despite the Luftwaffe flying 1,200 sorties. The pace of operations exhausted the machines and men. Often crews did not get out of their aircraft and made three or four sorties without rest. Liv Corps began its assault in the north on the seam of the Soviet defense sectors 3 and 4. The Shura Gustav weapon continued to fire against ammunition dumps, which produced no effect. Nevertheless, the 132nd Infantry Division was able to work its way up to the river. The 600mm guns concentrated on the coastal batteries and Maxim Gorky Fortress. Meanwhile, the German 22nd Infantry Division attacked further to the east. Some 200 Soviet reinforcements of the 79th Naval Infantry Brigade, protecting this sector, were lost in the bombardment, but the main defenses held out. The brigade held most of its forces in reserve, while committing only a single company to cover the hilly terrain on the Belbeck River front. German assault groups breached the first and reserve lines by 8.15. The German forces had to negotiate heavily mined areas, slowing them down and allowing the Soviet forces to make a partial recovery. Supporting operations by the 50th and 24th German infantry divisions failed, which cost the Wehrmacht 12 Stug assault guns. The remote control demolition units were not effective as the terrain was unsuitable. By 1715, the town of Belbeck was secured. The 22nd Infantry Division made considerable progress in breaking through the defenses of the 25th Rifle Division. The 50th Infantry Division supported the 22nd's left flank. 
now facing the Germans was the Haxius Ridge, on which the fortress Maxim Gorky was located. It was flanked by several smaller forts to the east. Now the 132nd Infantry Divisions was ordered to conduct a converging pincer movement on the Maxim Gorky Fortress in conjunction with the 22nd and 50th Infantry Divisions, to trap its defenders against the coast. The 132nd pushed into the 95th Rifle Division's positions north of the fort, while the other two divisions attacked in a flanking move. While the Germans did make progress, nearing the main railway station just southeast of Maxim Gorky, they were stopped from achieving a full-scale breakthrough by the 172nd Rifle Division. The 22nd and 50th Infantry Divisions had been heavily shelled by mortar fire from the 25th Rifle Division facing them east of the Haxius Ridge, which caused heavy casualties. By 1800 hours hours, the German attack was spent. Livecourt losses on 7 June amounted to 2,357 casualties in four divisions, including 340 killed. It had also expended 3,939 tons of ammunition. The 132nd Division had exhausted all of its basic munitions load by midday. On the other side, the formidable Soviet defense lines east and southeast of Belbek had been overrun, and the Germans succeeded in advancing two kilometers through dense Soviet defenses. The Soviet casualties had also been severe. It is estimated that three battalions were effectively destroyed. Monstein recognized the seriousness of the failure on the 8th of June. He was worried that the 132nd Infantry Division, locked in combat with the 79th Naval Brigade and 95th and 172nd Rifle Divisions north of the city on the Belbeck River front, was approaching the end of its strength. Once again, the army turned to the Luftwaffe for support. Richthofen responded by ordering attacks against Soviet supply lines. The same day, German bombers, including KG-100, began attacks on Soviet shipping. They sank the destroyer Sovosheniye, and the survey vessel Gueys, with the 4,727-ton transport Abkhazia and destroyer Svobodny following them on 10 June. The period between 8 to 12 June descended into a battle of attrition. Several Soviet counterattacks were repulsed with heavy losses. The German Liv Corps extended the salient on the seam of the 3 and 4 sector to 3 kilometers, determined to break through before Petrov could reinforce his lines. The 132nd Infantry Division cleared the Haxius Ridge while the 22nd Infantry Division overran most of the Soviet 79th Naval Infantry Brigade. The Soviet unit tried counterattacking on the 10th of June but was repulsed. The Soviet formation was effectively destroyed, with the support of the Luftwaffe, which used anti-personnel bombs against Soviet infantry caught in the open. Only one battalion was in a position to block the Germans from encircling the Maxim Gorky fort. Still, on 8 June Liv Corps had lost 1,700 men. In return, the lodgement in Soviet lines was extended to 3 km deep and 5 km wide. In the south, 30 Corps made no progress in four days of attacks. They suffered 496 casualties at the hands of the 109th Rifle Division. The 28th Light and 72nd Infantry Divisions had succeeded in puncturing the Soviet lines opposite the 109th and 388th Rifle Divisions. The outer defenses were broken in some parts, but the most were still in Soviet hands on the 12th of June. The main belt on the Sapun Ridge was unbroken. Soviet casualties amounted to 2,500, including 700 captured. By the 13th of June, 30 Corps had lost 2,659 men, including 394 killed. Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 4 Air Land Operations, 11-15 June As the Germans made slow progress toward the main train station, Petrov withdrew the battered 172nd Rifle Division and replaced it with 345th Rifle Division. The 95th Rifle Division halted the 132nd Division's progress in the north. Although a relatively quiet day, the 10th of June saw the elimination of the Soviet 79th Naval Brigade and Liv Corps lost, 
2,772 men. Counterattacks by the Soviet 345th Division aimed at the hinge between the German 132nd and 50th Divisions were repulsed by the Luftwaffe. On 11-12 June, Livkor lost another 1,957 men. The Red Army had committed all of its reserves and were stretched dangerously thin. One more push might collapse the northern sector. But at this time, the tired German infantry were running short on reinforcements and ammunition. In contrast, the Black Sea Fleet was bringing in reinforcements through Luftwaffe attacks. On 12 June the cruiser Molotov and destroyer Beitlnyi brought in 2,314 soldiers, 190 tons of ammunition and 28 artillery pieces. The Luftwaffe turned its attention to these convoys. On 13 June it sank the transports Grusia and TSCH-27, patrol boat SKA-092, motorboat SB-40, five barges, and a floating crane. On 15 June another 3,400 soldiers, 442 tons of ammunition, 30 tons of fuel and 12 tons of provisions reinforced the Soviet positions. The Luftwaffe had flown 1,044 sorties on the 11th of June, dropping 954 tons of bombs. The consumption rate of ammunition was putting von Richthofen's logistical network under strain and he could no longer afford to fly massed bombing raids. On the 11th of June, he surmised there was less than two days' worth of munitions left, requiring a change of tactics. Instead of carpet bombing, fewer targets would be attacked simultaneously, and aircraft would strike at designated targets in long and narrow lines. This was designed to maintain accurate pressure without wasting ordnance. Even this failed to alleviate shortages in the long term. By the 17th of June, scarcity of aviation fuel meant the Luftwaffe dropped only 800 instead of the planned 1,000 tons of bombs. Adding to the Luftwaffe's troubles in the sector, von Richthofen was transferred to prepare the Corps headquarters near Kusk, to support the upcoming Operation Blue, the German summer offensive in southern Russia. He retained formal command, at least until given control of Luftflotte 4, but Wolfgang von Weil took over air operations over Sevastopol. The primary objective for the 22nd Infantry Division on 13 June was Fort Stalin, blocking the advance to Sevenaya Bay. It was a tough position. The fortifications allowed the Soviet forces to concentrate artillery against breakthroughs and machine gun posts protected the fort from southern and eastern attacks, but it was vulnerable from a northern assault. In addition, only 200 men from the 345th Rifle Division were stationed there. The Germans launched their assault on the position at 3 o'clock on 13 June with just 813 men. The 3rd Battalion was assigned to suppress Soviet machine gun and mortar positions located on the southeast as a diversion. The 1st Battalion, supported by five Stug assault guns, two 37mm guns and an engineer company, were to serve as the main effort. Some 200 and 110 men were committed respectively in each unit. German bombardment began on 12 June. Artillery fire from Dora had failed to neutralize the fort. Nevertheless, a combined arms attack from 11 420mm mortars and dive bombing by Ju 87s of SDG 77 knocked out the fort's main armament. At 1900 hours, the 22nd Divisional Artillery began shelling the fort and its smaller supporting fortress, Volga, located to Stalin's rear, with 210. 280 and 305 mm weapons. At 3 o'clock the German infantry attacked. The fog of war intervened. The Soviet mortar teams were not suppressed, and a fierce battle developed which lasted until 5.30. The Germans, with the support of five assault guns and a few 37 mm weapons, silenced the fort, bunker by bunker. In the heavy fighting a large number of company commanders were killed. As the Germans eased this vital fort, the neighboring Volga fort realized it had fallen and shelled the position. A company-sized counterattack by the Soviet forces was wiped out by German small arms fire. The Germans declared the position secured at 7 o'clock, 
though some bunkers held out until 1500 hours. German casualties amounted to 32 dead, 126 wounded and two missing, half of the force committed. Soviet casualties amounted to 20 captured, the remainder were killed. With only 91 men left near the fort, Petrov did not order a recovery attempt, a grave mistake. The fall of Fort Stalin meant the Soviet defenses in the north were on the verge of collapse. Hansen ordered Liv Corps to divert its attention to Fort Maxim Gorky, and the elimination of the Soviet 95th Rifle Division. The 95th Rifle Division had been halting the 132nd Infantry Division's progress since the start of the offensive. The 132nd was reinforced by one regiment from the idle 46th Infantry Division near Kerch. The German 24th, 50th and Romanian 4th Mountain Divisions were to maintain pressure in the central sector while they pushed towards the Mikensha and Katanai Valley and the Chernaya River opening at Sevenaya Bay. For three days, 14 to 16 June, the battle continued as the Axis advanced towards Sevastopol in the face of Soviet resistance. On the 15th of June the 132nd was within 900 meters of the Maxim Gorky's outer bastion. The front opposite the 25th Soviet rifles was still strong, but the northern flank was giving way. The 79th Naval Brigade had only 35% of its fighting strength remaining. Blocking the way to Maxim Gorky were just 1,000 men of the 95th Rifle Division and 7th Naval Brigade. In the south the Soviet 109th and 388th Rifle Divisions were forced back along the coast by the German 72nd and 170th Infantry Divisions while the Romanian Corps 18th Mountain Division dislodged the Soviet 386th Rifle Division threatening 30 Corps right flank. The battles continued to grind on until 20 June. In six days, 30 Corps had lost 2,646 men. In exchange the outer defences of the 388th Rifle Division had been broken, and the formation effectively destroyed. Still, the German advance on Balaclava had been halted. The Germans had not yet reached its outer defences and the Sapun Ridge to the east of the town was still under Soviet control. By the 15th of June, some 1,000 Soviet soldiers and 1,500 mortar bombs had been captured, indicating the Soviet forces had plenty of ammunition after two weeks of battle. Despite shortages of aviation fuel and ordnance, the Luftwaffe had played a significant part in the success of the German operations. From 13 June until 17 June, it flew 3,899 sorties and dropped 3,086 tons of bombs. This average of 780 sorties per day was only a slight drop from the opening 11 days. Massed sorties were made on the city of Sevastopol itself. Bombing targeted hangars, port facilities, flak and artillery batteries, barracks, and supply depots with high explosive bombs. Most of the city was engulfed in flames. The smoke rose to 1,500 meters and stretched as far as Feodosia, 150 kilometers away. Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 5 Ground Fighting, 16-28 June As Hansen poised his corps for the breakthrough against the 95th Rifle Division, 27 Ju 87s of 2 slash SDG 77 attacked Maxim Gorky's main battery. The Germans believed the strike had knocked it out as it stopped firing its artillery. The artillery bombardment began on the 16th of June. In the morning the attack by the reinforced 132nd Division collapsed the line. The Soviet garrison held out in tunnels, capitulating on the 20th of June. The 22nd and 24th Infantry Divisions advanced from the northeast. They employed their Goliath remote control demolition vehicles with success against the timber bunkers. One exploded prematurely and two were knocked out by a minefield. Two Panzer III control vehicles were knocked out by Soviet anti-tank fire. By 1930, Forts Maxim Gorky, Molotov, Skishkova, Volga and Siberia were overrun. The 24th Infantry Division in particular made extensive use of its naval Werfer rockets. 
the 95th and 172nd Rifle Divisions had been lost, as well as the majority of the fortified defences. Only the 25th Rifle remained in the line. Petrov rushed up the 138th Naval Brigade with an extra 2,600 men, which was landed on the 12-13 June. It prevented German forces reaching Sevenaya Bay that day. The Luftwaffe was also engaged in applying pressure to Soviet naval forces. On the 18th of June, the cruiser Kharkov was severely damaged. Attacks on the 19th of June by KG-51 destroyed the anti-aircraft platform in Sevenaya Bay, allowing air operations to continue unopposed. The lack of anti-aircraft cover made it impossible for the Minilea Comintern to enter the harbour with reinforcements. The lack of supplies resulted in Soviet ammunition and fuel supplies slipping to critical levels on 20 June. The Luftwaffe was experiencing shortages of its own. The daily average of sorties was now reduced by 40%. Due to the shortages of bombs, all ordnance had to be dropped individually to minimize wastage. Some experienced crews had to conduct dive bombing attacks 25 to 30 times a day. KG 51's Ju 88 crews in particular had felt the strain. The pressure took its toll, and between the 18 to 23 June, the entire Soviet defense line in and the north collapsed. The remnants of the 95th Rifle Division was huddled into a 2 km square portion of coastline near Coastal Battery 12, north of the bay. At 9 o'clock the battery and the division surrendered to the 132nd Infantry Division. Further south the 24th Infantry Division captured Bartenayevka, on the mouth of the bay. The 22nd Infantry Division had reached the north of the bay on the same day. The Soviet 138th Naval Brigade counterattacked, but it was destroyed without artillery and air support. On the 20th of June, the 24th Infantry Division tackled the main obstacle remaining on the north side of the bay. The Lenin anti-aircraft position protected by the northern fort, a position which had a 5 meters wide anti-tank ditch, 1,000 mines, 32 concrete bunkers, 7 armored cupolas, and 70 earth and timber bunkers making it a formidable defensive position. The Lenin defenses surrendered, having already lost three of their 476mm weapons. The Germans tried to use the remote-controlled mines to break into the North Fort, but they were knocked out. At 11.30 on 21 June the fort fell after a sustained infantry attack. Around 182 Soviet prisoners were taken. The Germans began mopping up operations and clearing the northern shore. Most Soviet units were exhausted and out of ammunition, surrendering quickly. Others made attempts at a last stand. Some tried to evacuate across to the southern side by boat, but they were picked off by German artillery. While the main actions were playing out in the north, 30 corps alternated between attack and defense. The Soviet forces held the Sapun Ridge and could observe German movements. On occasion they could deliver effective counter-battery fire. Between the 21 to 28 June, the Germans lost 10 artillery pieces, including five 150mm S. FH-18 medium howitzers. In the center, the Romanians took up the slack. The 18th Infantry, 1st, and 4th Mountain Divisions, supported by 100 guns, gradually advanced up the Chernaya River towards the mouth of the river and Sevenaya Bay. With support from Liv Corps on its left, the Axis captured all the Soviet defensive lines east of the Chernaya River. The Luftwaffe had contributed 4,700 sorties in seven days up until 26 June. They dropped 3,984 tons of bombs. The daily average sorties had decreased 15% from the week before and 10% the week before that. The increasing operational readiness revealed the severity of bomb and fuel shortages. Von Wild, despite the withdrawal of some Jeshwada for Operation Blue, did succeed in bringing in much-needed reinforcements to bring the strength levels up to a standard not seen since the start of the offensive. The Luftwaffe continued the intense bombardment. On 26 June, its attacks supporting 30 Corps, 
devastated Soviet defenses on the Sapun Ridge. It was the last Soviet defensive line between the Axis and Sevastopol. Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 6 Axis Land, Sea and Air Offensive, 29 June Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 7 Fall of Sevastopol, 30 June to 4 July Ekchebrisky and Petrov were flown out at the last moment. Major General Pyotr Georgievich Novikov took command of the defense. On 30 June, with Corps launched a heavy assault, supported by heavy Luftwaffe bombardment and several dozen guns. Heavy fighting took place for the next three days, but it was becoming clear that the Red Army could not hold their increasingly untenable positions for more than a day, at most. On 3 July, the last line of Soviet defense was breached. The following day, the last of the Soviet defenses were overrun and all organized resistance collapsed. The few remaining Red Army units continued to put up scattered resistance to the south of the city, which lasted until 9 July. The fall of Sevastopol was announced by a special radio communique. Above the city and port flutter the German and Romanian flags. German and Romanian troops under the command of Colonel General von Monstein, steadfastly supported by Colonel General von Richthofen's battle-hardened air corps, after 25 days of fierce battle, have as of midday today, taken the most powerful land and sea fortress of all that have ever existed in the world. Chapter 5, Aftermath The Germans claimed that over 90,000 Red Army soldiers had been taken prisoner, and a greater number killed. This claim appears to be overstated as, according to Soviet sources, the Soviet garrison defending Sevastopol totaled 106,000 men at the start of the siege plus 3,000 reinforcements during the attack. Further, it is known that 25,157 persons were evacuated, the overwhelming majority either wounded soldiers or officers evacuated on Stalin's orders. Romania's contribution was honored when the Crimea Shield in gold was first bestowed upon Marshal Ion Antonescu on 3 July 1942. It was awarded to him in Bucharest by Monstein, on Hitler's behalf. The second and last Golden Crimpschild was awarded to Monstein himself, on 24 November 1942. From 2 June to 3 July 8th Air Corps had flown 23,751 sorties and dropped 20,528 tons of bombs. German artillery had fired a further 46,750 tons of munitions, with total Axis munitions consumption coming to 67,278 tons over the course of one month. The Luftwaffe claimed to have destroyed 611 motor vehicles, 123 aircraft of which 18 on the ground, 38 artillery pieces, 10 tanks, a locomotive and a flak barge. Further destroyed were 48 Soviet artillery batteries, 28 barracks and industrial buildings, 20 bunkers, 11 ammunition depots, 10 fuel depots, a bridge and an observation post. Hundreds more motor vehicles had been damaged along with 7 artillery pieces, 43 artillery batteries, 2 barracks and another bridge. German aerial attacks had sunk 10,800 tons of Soviet shipping including 4 destroyers, a submarine, 3 motor torpedo boats, 6 coastal vessels and 4 freighters. 12,000 tons of shipping were also damaged, with 2 destroyers, 10 coastal vessels and 2 freighters among the losses. Although ultimately a German success, the operation took much longer than the Germans had expected. Operation Blau, Army Group South's advance towards Stalingrad and the Caucasus, was just beginning, and the German offensive did not have the 11th Army to support it. Instead, the German 6th Army under Paulus was without crucial support, ultimately contributing to its defeat.